Hi, this is Hightower. I'm a technologist uh, here in the uh, telecom corridor in Dallas, Texas, uh, IoT Central for the U.S. Uh, I've been in wireless, telecom, and uh, cellular industries for over 20 years. And I've been in uh, sales engineering, been an entrepreneur, a uh, account, uh, business development, and a technical sales account manager as well. Uh, today I'm focused on the Internet of Things and I uh, want to talk to you about uh, low power wide area networks. There's six approaches that are uh, getting people's attention that uh, getting uh, momentum and uh, there's many other ones coming as well so this is uh, this is the wild west of low power winds uh, right now uh, a lot of competing uh, approaches and protocols and business models so it's going to be very interesting to watch it uh, uh, unfold and I'm going to give a, just a quick history of uh, machine to machine and how that's evolved into the Internet of Things. And I'll talk about the three components. I break it down into devices, remote objects, remote terminals, in nodes, whatever you want to call them. And then the connectivity part, which can be wireline, but usually it's going to be wireless uh, networks that will connect these devices to the back end. And then the back end will be the, uh, the business processes, the computer systems, the cloud, the databases, the analytics, the big data that will be analyzing and doing, doing things and re responding to this information that it receives. Now, and then I'll, I'll actually focus mostly on the low power winds uh, in my presentation. So uh, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, all the different people, uh, companies that have provided information. Google is an awesome resource and uh, I appreciate that this is all their information that I've collaborate, uh, collected and put out here uh, for us to understand better what's going on in the industry. That's all my personal observations. The, the background on, on the machine to machine, it actually started over 150 years ago, back in the early 1800s. Uh, a Russian, uh, Baron and Schilling, uh, started uh, a device, created a device that was able to transmit uh, information uh, over a, a distance, and then a couple, uh, year later, uh, two Germans took that and uh, created what we know now as the uh, telegraph. And uh, then in eight, uh, 1844, Samuel Morse created Morse code. And that started communications, but it also was the beginning of machine to machine uh, talking to each other and giving information to uh, uh, the people that were using those devices. So, uh, what's interesting also, Nikola. Uh, Tesla, one of my uh, heroes, uh, said in 1926, he's a visionary uh, man. The more we understand what he did, it's amazing. Uh, he foresaw the eventuality of the Internet of Things and smartphones because he talked about the wireless, uh, the world will be uh, com uh, covered with the wireless network infrastructure and that will monitor and control many different things and aspects of our life and our world uh, and it will all be able to be controlled from devices in our pocket. So very very interesting and very uh, insightful. Now most of us know about uh, machine to machine um, as uh, other names, uh, telemetry, SCADA, industrial automation, and telematics. Uh, and it uses uh, medium like uh, wireline and microwave and private radio, Wi-Fi, and satellite. Now, um, what's happening now because of Moore's Law, the doubling of, of uh, computer power, and the introduction of exponential technologies uh, which apply to more than just computers, uh, we're going to see the cost of sensors and devices and processors uh, and equipment and all this technology, the price will go down and the capability will go up and that's going to enable uh, the uh, implementation of us to be able to monitor and control billions of devices. Uh, uh, several companies are predicting that we'll have 50 billion devices that will monitor and control. We have maybe 5 billion now. And uh, it'll be 50 billion in the next 5 to 10 years. And with that, we're going to have incredible amounts of data passing back and forth and, and uh, being uh, out there that we need to be able to monitor and control. Uh, and those different... Um, uh, devices are going, all that capability is going to create an inflection point that we've never seen uh, anything as, as uh, impactful as that. Now, Andy Grove started uh, Intel back many years ago as a co-founder, and he, through his career, he noticed there were many times in, in uh, our history where things happen that change the way we do business, that change the world and the perception and the way things are done. And uh, for him, it started back in the 58, 1958 when Jack Kilby and Robert Noyce created the integrated circuit, and that's now created the electronics marvelous world that we have nowadays. And then in 84, the Bell uh, Telephone Monopoly here in the, in the States 
uh, was disbanded, and that led us to innovation that uh, has revolutionized our communication capabilities. And of course, in the early 80s, we had the personal computer. In the 90s, we had the internet that became uh, available to the masses. And then in 20, uh, 2007, uh, Steve Jobs changed the world when he introduced the iPhone. Well, the Internet of Things is going to be something far beyond that even, uh, and will change the world in ways we can't even imagine yet. And it will become, what, hap what will happen is these, these silo point solution uh, uh, systems, uh, MTM systems are going to start being interconnected and uh, data from one silo, uh, one point solution, one uh, set of uh, domain of information is going to be uh, compared and contrasted and, and combined with information from other domains and then we're going to get insights into the world that we never had before. It will become the nervous system for the planet and give us more capabilities and uh, efficiencies and, and change our world in ways that we can't even imagine right now. So I break down the Internet of Things into three positions or three parts, uh, the devices, the end nodes, uh, the, whatever you want to call uh, the, the remote equipment and the objects that are out there. Then the connectivity, whatever it's going to take to bring that information from the field back uh, to the, uh, the back end. And the connectivity is oftentimes going to be wireless. And I'm a radio guy. Uh, uh, Motorola, Ericsson, Nortel, and AT&T. So I know uh, and understand the wireless part of the world. So that's what I'm going to focus on, particularly the low-power WAN stuff. And on the back end, that's a, a world into itself with all the computer systems, the cloud, the storage, the databases, the an big analytics that we'll be using, big data that we'll be using to do something useful and powerful with this information that's going to be coming to us. So the uh, networks that are available now are typically the wireline, the microwave, uh, private radio, traditional cellular, 2G, 3G, and LTE, and then the coming 5G uh, technologies, and Wi-Fi mesh, and uh, Zigbee, and other short-range device technologies, SRD, and satellite communications. Now, those are all have pros and cons to them. The, the problems with wireline, of course, it doesn't go everywhere it needs to go. Cellular is very expensive, not only in the power that the devices use, but also the the complexity of setting up a call and taking down a call just to send a short amount of data to and from these uh, machines that are, the objects are in the field uh, so it's not and, and 2G was was better and 3G is worse because of all the complexity and, and LTE is very complex so it gets not a very good solution for the short messages that these machines are going to need and of course Wi-Fi mesh it could be these other short range technologies are limited because they only go short range and you have to have a backbone to time all together that gets expensive and then private radio and microwave is not ubiquitous it does have its place for private systems and for certain situations but it won't uh, cover large areas and then satellite does cover large areas but it's very expensive and it doesn't have good penetration because of the frequencies they have to use um, one of the things we'll find is that uh, anything below one gigahertz uh, has good transmission capabilities for going long distances and penetrating things. Anything above that tends to act more like light. So I'll get into that more in a moment. But uh, for machine communications, uh, this company, Machine Research, is excellent. Uh, if you can read into articles from them, they do a lot of good uh, research and uh, publish a lot of good information, so it's very powerful. They uh, see that machines, objects in the field, oftentimes only need, and a majority of the times, only need short uh, messages, very few bytes of data just to transmit their status, uh, the fact that an event happened, something triggered them, that remote device to want to report in, maybe a temperature or, or some other reading, uh, very short. And these devices don't need to be real-time, so some latency can be uh, acceptable. Uh, so if it takes a little bit of time to get in and out, uh, transmit and penetrate into these bubbles to get the information out, that's okay. But one of the key things uh, these machines need is long battery life because you're going to be installing some of these in very harsh uh, locations, uh, deep in vaults and deep in buildings, um, places where you don't want to go. You, you may not be able to have access uh, very easily, so you want to uh, have them stay out for a long time. So the goal for a lot of these low power land systems is that the batteries last at least 10 years. And then you want to have in-building coverage and, and coverage into vaults and places where this equipment might be stored that radio signals have a difficulty to get into. So these technologies, these low-power winds, need to be able to adjust their techniques so they can get into those deep areas and get a message into them and, and a message out of those areas. So 
Uh, Simtech is a semiconductor company that's been involved in, in uh, the Internet of Things and machine-to-machine communications for many years, and they've done some analysis, too. And they show that the market will have uh, significant, uh, you know, some will have cellular capabilities uh, in the green there, and some will have, uh, will use the low power, uh, the short range, I'm sorry, the short range lands and Bluetooth technology. But the majority of devices out there uh, will need low power WAN capabilities. Now, low power WANs, we're going to define those, define that better in a moment, but um, it, it basically low power Long range sub gigahertz is the characteristic of a low power WAN capability typically, um, and they they did further analysis and this is uh, looking at the revenue that's going to be generated uh, by these different uh, techniques and, and appro approaches uh, to the Internet of Things, and they say 35 percent SOM uh, share of market will be for uh, uh, captured by the short range technologies, the cellular on the far right side. Uh, traditional cellular with 2G, 3G, and 5G, whatnot, will capture 10% of the market. The majority of the market, 55% or more, will be uh, s serviced and uh, available through low power WAN systems. So, very interesting uh, what's going to happen here in the next five and 10 years. Now, as I say uh, earlier, low power WAN, so the, the thing, characteristics about a low power WAN is it needs to be low power in its transmit technology so that it can use frequencies, unlicensed frequencies, uh, and stay below the rules and regulations that uh, the FCC and the uh, Ofcom and, and other uh, regulation, regulation groups uh, mandate. It needs to have long range, so sub gigahertz low power uh, can uh, get you good range um, to transmit your signals. The devices need to have low power consumption and long battery lives. The whole network needs to be low cost in its, uh, in its cost structure, uh, the infrastructure and all. And it needs to be scalable because we're going to have tens of thousands and sometimes maybe a million devices talking to a base station or to a gateway. Uh, and it, then the, the system needs to be able to support mobility of those devices, those objects. They may, like cars, they may be moving on a regular basis or you may pick up a device and move it from one location to the next. It needs, the system needs to be able to support that. And all this communication needs to be reliable. So there are six approaches that I'm going to talk about that um, these sometimes are just the protocols or they're, they're the companies who have a proprietary protocol. And uh, it, it, these guys are, have got probably the most momentum, the, the, the most, uh, get the most press right now. But there are other companies bringing their technologies, their approaches, and their standards uh, to the marketplace. So stay tuned. There's going to be a lot more uh, coming out here in the near future. But this will give you a good basis to understand what's happening in the marketplace. So Sigfox uh, has got a head start. They've got a, a compelling business uh, model. And uh, I'll talk about more in detail in a moment. But they, they're uh, running and gunning with their low-power WAN systems. LoRa WANs is part of the LoRa Alliance, or is the protocol for them. And Symtech started that, and now they've got a, a group of people, IBM and uh, Akility and some other companies that are supporting uh, that approach. And uh, then the Weightless N and Weightless P standards are from the Weightless.org, uh, Weightless Special Interest Group out of the UK. And uh, they actually started with Weightless W for white space, and uh, they've shelved it right for right now because uh, only the U.S. and the U.K., uh, in the developed world has approved the use of low power uh, unlicensed uh, use in the TV white space frequencies which that protocol, the W protocol was created for. So they shelved that for now until other countries catch up. So in the meantime they've uh, created another weightless N protocol which has a lot of similarities. It's uh, ultra narrow band like Sigfox and then the weightless P protocol which has a lot of similarities to LoRa WAN and I'll talk more in detail in a moment, but uh, very interesting. Those are pure protocols and uh, royalty-free uh, type uh, public open protocols. And then uh, RPM, Random Phase Multiple Access by Engine, formerly uh, owned ramp, uh, is, a, is kind of a very interesting because they use 2.4 gigahertz above a gigahertz, uh, the 2.4 Wi-Fi frequencies, but they are more focused on coverage. So I'll, I'll talk about that more in a moment. They've got uh, some interesting ideas. And then the, the real one to watch down here is the narrowband LTE. Uh, it's the protocol that was just uh, agreed to by the Cellular Standards Committee, 3GPP, and 
Uh, I'll talk more detail about that, but that's going to be very interesting to watch it as it gets developed and rolled out. So uh, besides the characteristics of low power, long range, long battery life, that kind of thing, there are a couple of characteristics uh, of the different approaches that these low power wind companies are taking. And so um, some of the companies are taking the idea of uh, narrow band or ultra narrow band. So they put all their energy into, uh, into a, one small uh, part of the spectrum. Uh, and then other companies are using the spread spectrum uh, approach. And I got another slide on that. I'll show you in a moment the differences there. And then most of them are going after unlicensed frequencies, but of course the, the cellular industry will have their dedicated uh, frequencies that they can use in whatever manner they want. Uh, so uh, there's different ways that we, that we can achieve what we need to do. And we'll need to do something because the present uh, networks out there would not even satisfy a fourth of the demand that's going to be put uh, on the networks uh, in the future. So we've got to come up with alternative ways to get information from those devices back into the, uh, the back-end systems. So when we talk about the difference between ultra-narrowband or narrowband and spread spectrum, that center uh, spike there is a narrowband signal. So they concentrate all of the transmit power into a very narrow uh, bandwidth so they can punch through the noise and uh, get through other interference and get the signal uh, to the receiver. The alternative is to do sped spectrum, and this is what the military uses, um, and they use techniques to be able to pull the signal out of the noise floor and uh, be able to avoid interference and uh, get the signal passed through. So uh, two different ways of, of accomplishing how to deal these are unlicensed frequencies, but they're very hostile environments because there's a lot of noise and interference in those signals and a lot of co-channel users. Uh, there's no restriction on who can go into those frequencies, so it, it can get very congested. So you have to use these various techniques to be able to push the signal through. So the SigFox folks, uh, they got a very compelling business model. They've got um, a technology that they brought to market. When the waitlist group was working on Debye, uh, a Frenchman was working on the idea of ultra-narrow band, and he realized that the ISM frequencies, the industrial, scientific, and medical frequencies, 868 in Europe and 902 to 928 here in the States, uh, were available uh, if you stayed un within the rules and regulations that the FCC and Ofcom and whatnot uh, uh, require, then you could use this ultra-narrowband technology to be able to send your signals uh, to and from devices. And when he started off, it was one way, and now he's added two-way capabilities. Now, in the SigFox system, it's extremely low data throughput. So we're talking about 100 bits per second, and only 140 messages per day uh, is allowed uh, via the rules. Um, and uh, he did add two-way in late 2014. Uh, the compelling business model is that um, they create the technology, the devices, and they go to countries and they have someone that's already ex uh, in, in country that's uh, in place with uh, s uh, some sort of telecommunication, either system or expertise, uh, tower sites or backhaul back or whatever, backbone. Uh, and they then champion, uh, partner with those, those people in that country to install the SigFox system. So it's a, a revenue sharing and uh, a partnership when they go in. So SigFox is not on uh, the hook for everything. And so these people in the country know how to deal with the country issues there. So they've already deployed in over eight countries and their plan is to go into over 60 countries in five years uh, and provide a global uh, cellular IoT uh, network. And uh, they've got a very strong uh, ecosystem and investment partners. Uh, they've got people like Samsung and uh, Telefonica and SK Telecom. Some very big names in the telecom world are supporting them. <laughs> and the, the proof's in the pudding. They, uh, since Sigfox has received over $150 million in, in investments over the, uh, the last four rounds of investing from 14 different investors. So they've got a strong uh, support and uh, model, business model. And they're about to launch in 10 uh, cities here in the U.S. in addition. So they're, they're running and gunning. So the other company that, uh, that's very interesting, they have a little different approach. These guys are doing sped spectrum. Now, the SigFox system is proprietary. They're going to hold on to that. If you want to use their technology, you have to license it from them. Same thing with LoRa WANs. At the physical link layer, uh, 
SimTech uh, owns the IP for that. So to be able to manufacture devices using this protocol, you'll have to license the technology from them. It is spread spectrum, but it is two-way. That's a robust set of features that they provide. Uh, so it's not, Sigfox is a very simple, very low uh, throughput. Uh, LoRa has a higher throughput capability, but they've kind of broken it up so that you've got three different classes depending on what your needs are. So if you want to be something similar to Sigfox, then you do a class A, and uh, this uh, lengthens the time of the battery. So class A, only when the device has an event happen, some significant thing happens that triggers it, then it wakes up and sends in a message to the, the base station, to the gateway. Uh, otherwise, it goes to sleep, and uh, when it sends that message, then it stays awake for a moment to receive a message back from the base station, uh, either uh, acknowledgement or some sort of update, uh, though it would be a very short message, and then it goes back to sleep. So battery can last a long time. Uh, in the class B, then uh, it wakes up when it needs to and sends information in, but periodically it wakes up to see if there's anything that the base station needs to send to it, the gateway. And then the class C is the receiver on the device stays open all the time and only closes for a moment when, it, when that device needs to transmit something back to the gateway. Uh, and otherwise, it's in the receive mode. So, um, and they've got many features and capabilities and techniques for getting the signal through using the, the sped, spread spectrum uh, technology. Uh, they're backed, uh, uh, partners with uh, IBM and uh, some other companies, and the alliance is growing. Uh, their hope is to have 10-year battery life. These systems haven't been in the field long enough to know if these are good numbers, uh, but it's a, it's a good start. And um, for their range, they're saying 10 miles uh, in the city, that's probably going to be down to uh, just a couple of miles because of all of the, can the buildings and the canyon effect uh, and blockage and whatnot. And they can handle many devices, and they're uh, highly secure with AES-128 uh, or 126. And uh, the, all of these systems are star of star kind of technology. So on the right-hand side, you have a good idea. Uh, you have your computer system, your back end, uh, represented by that uh, computer on the far right. And then it talks out to the gateways or the base stations. Um, and this is typically a wireline, a backhaul, uh, Ethernet probably, uh, going out to those base stations and, and uh, our, our gateways. And then they go talk out via wireless, the low-power WAN system, out to the remote devices. Uh, in the LoRa system, then, uh, they have their LoRa endpoints and their gateway, and then it talks back to the server. So uh, it's, that's typical of all of these systems in the star-on-star, uh, star star-of-star star of star systems. Now, the other protocol, the weightless N protocol, N for N-Wave, uh, they donated their intellectual property, their IP, uh, to the weightless SIG standard so they can be an open, royalty-free royalty -free, uh, licensing arrangement. Uh, no royalties. And it is based on the idea of ultra-narrow band, 200 hertz, very, very uh, narrow, uh, and very low data throughput, like Sigfox. And their expectation is to their battery will last a long time. What's interesting, their technology is very, very good, very uh, good for particularly this application of where you just need short messages. And they won the Cisco UK big competition, British Innovation Gateway competition uh, uh, back in uh, last month uh, in October. And uh, uh, right now, it's one-way system, but they're adding or plan to add uh, two-way to it, uh, much like the Class A system uh, for LoRa. Uh, so it'll transmit and then wake up for a few moments or stay awake for a few moments to receive something back. So that should keep the battery uh, able to operate for a long time. And they use various techniques uh, and their their sub gigahertz and their frequency band, the ISM bands uh, that they can work in. Now, Weightless P is the other protocol that's being worked on right now. Um, this was IP or intellectual property donated by M Squared or M2 Communications out of Taiwan. They've been in uh, the semiconductor business and, and wireless for a long time, and they have then uh, worked or are working with the Weightless SIG group uh, to create a more robust. So this is more like uh, LoRa with higher data transfer capability, so the, it'll affect the battery somewhat, but it has a lot of... Uh, 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 features to it. So it's feature rich in its capabilities. So it'll be high performance, it'll be two way. It will work in many different other bands besides just the uh, 868 and the 902 
uh, frequency band, 915 is the center frequency. Uh, and it will go relatively long range and, and it can go to sleep and be uh, ultra, ultra low power in its capabilities and it can support tens of thousands up to 50,000 clients on each gateway or each base station. Uh, and because of the robust feature set and, and the capabilities, it's going to be a very uh, robust communications protocol uh, and, and be something to be useful certain applications. So keep your eye on that. The, the protocol is in the waitlist SIG right now. It should be complete by the end of this year, and they've already got product uh, waiting on the shelf ready uh, to just whatever they need to do to finish up and get it out the door in early 2016. So you'll see... All of these networks are going to be racing to get up to speed before the cellular guys come online. So I'll talk about that more in a moment. The other company and other approach here is uh, RPA, RPMA, Random Phase Multiple Access from Ingenue, formerly uh, OnRamp. Uh, their protocol is also uh, proprietary, but they're instead of going sub gigahertz, they're going at the 2.4 gigahertz range. Uh, they have, have actually up to 40 channels that they can choose from, and they're uh, using spread spectrum, direct sequence, uh, and they've got t 35 private networks around the world uh, up and working, and they're having good luck with that. Their focus is on coverage. They're not so interested and worried about uh, penetrating into it, and most of the time where it looks like uh, that these systems are on the power grid, so they don't have a problem with power, so they're not so worried about uh, running off of batteries and trying to last for years and years and years. But, so their, their focus is coverage, They've got uh, decent uh, transmit uh, uplinks and downlinks, so you can transmit a, a good amount of information. They just recently sold off some of their their uh, private systems that they've been supporting to Trilliant, uh, who has a dashboard and, and uh, would like to have access to their te technology, to uh, Ingenue's technology. And that actually uh, gives Ingenue some uh, revenue stream uh, and lets Ingenue then focus on this new uh, network they're going to deploy uh, in the United States. They're going to be into 30 cities uh, in 2016. They're coming to Dallas and Phoenix uh, before the end of uh, this year. Uh, and that's where they want to focus their energies, creating this new public network based on 2.4 uh, gigahertz frequencies. So uh, think something to watch. Uh, could have its applications. So the, the ones to really watch out for here are, this is the cellular frequency or cellular protocol that's being worked on. Uh, there were competing protocols being promoted to the standards committee, the 3GPP group. Uh, Huawei, and I'll show them in a second, but uh, Huawei had a, uh, an overlay network that they were po proposing. But uh, Nokia, Ericsson, and Intel had created and been promoting and, and lobbying for a different approach, which would actually take advantage of a lot of the existing infrastructure and equipment that the cellular industry has in place. Um, they put a lot of money into these LTE networks, and they don't want to have to be adding incremental money on top of that. They can be putting uh, these devices into a lot of the existing equipment and use the same chipsets a lot of times for what they're doing. The really good part is once this protocol has been accepted um, and approved and equipment is being created, it will work on existing LTE bands, so they'll be able to interleave um, LP WAN short messages for machines in with the voice communication that's going on. They'll take advantage of the uh, resource uh, blocks, uh, about 180 kilohertz wide signals that are available in the LTE to transmit this short these short messages uh, in and out, or they can put those frequencies or put those transmissions in the guard bands. Uh, they, the carriers, own all these frequencies. They can do anything they want with those frequencies. So they have all the choice here. And as they reform their old 2G and the OGSM systems, uh, they could even dedicate those uh, channels, those that spectrum, uh, to IoT if they want to. So they have lots of flexibility and, and capabilities. It's not an overlay network. It is uh, integrated into what they presently have. So that's real attractive to them. And it'll be low cost and it'll be uh, low power. Uh, and low power consumption capability. So it, it, it will fit very well with a lot of the needs of the low power WAN uh, and Internet of Things uh, requirements. The competing t technology from Huawei was called Narrowband Cellular IoT, uh, and Vodafone and China Unicom were behind it. Uh, it actually came out, came out of the Weightless W uh, protocol that was developed by the Weightless SIG group uh, and modified for the cellular industry. But because it's an overlay, it didn't... Uh, 
uh, pass muster. And then the LTE, uh, NVLTE, or uh, the, the 3GPP group calls it NB, uh, IOT, which is very generic. So most people are going to NBLTE to differentiate and explain. That's the 3GPP standard that uh, they're working on. They'll finish the standard in December, and they will include it in the release 13 that's planned for uh, uh, early 2016. So these are the people that have signed up. Uh, these are the carriers. These are some significant players uh, in the cellular industry. They've signed up. They said this is a, a something we're going to get behind, and we'll be implementing as soon as we can. The pro problem, or it will probably take. Um, the early uh, early part of 2016 to come out with the standard, then they will uh, have to start pre creating product and then implementing. So we're looking at uh, 2017, 2018 before we see uh, wide scale deployment of this approach. But once it takes off, then you'll have uh, a, the carriers to go to. You'll have their infrastructure, their SLAs, and if you if you want to work with a big organization, a big carrier like that, and have a universal standard, then that's a, very attractive cost structure uh, may be a problem. And the other thing that these other competing standards and protocols and companies have in the, to their advantage is they probably have a three-year head start to grab market share and to prove out their technologies. So Sigfox and uh, LoRa and the weightless standards may get a foothold and find a niche uh, in which they can uh, get customers and then be able to compete against the cellular, company, cellular companies when they uh, come online with their capabilities. So it's going to be very interesting. These guys have their challenges uh, ahead, but they have an opportunity uh, to to grab customer and market share and and, uh, and keep their companies and their approaches alive. So um, welcome to go to these sites. A lot of more information. There's things happening every day. So uh, Google is your friend. Uh, uh, keep up with the uh, low-power win initiatives and new introductions. Um, and you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, I'm uh, on LinkedIn, so I'm uh, Ed Hightower here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, and uh, this is my uh, contact information as well, uh, uh, Ed Hightower at iotandbeyond.com uh, here in the telecom corridor in Dallas, Texas. So I enjoyed uh, uh, presenting today and uh, hope that uh, it was uh, informative and useful. Take care.